It's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, episode 51, and I would like to talk about music and food, specifically how the presence of music in a dining situation affects the way we eat and how food tastes. Like many related things, music and food are often found in the same places. Eating and drinking establishments generally play music, just as music venues generally offer drink and sometimes food. Ancient depictions of feasting very often show someone playing an instrument nearby. You see this across lots of cultures, but you especially see it in ancient Greek pottery. Every ancient Greek dinner table apparently had a lyre on it as some kind of centerpiece, or there's some naked guy blowing into an aulos while people try to eat. The aulos being the uh, double-barreled oboe thingy that sounds like bagpipes. It is incredibly shrill. It's hard for me to imagine people eating a nice dinner and being relaxed by the piercing nasal shriek of the aulos, which is so loud and so penetrating that it was used on the battlefield like bugles or or bagpipes to signal, you know, retreat or charge or whatever. But hey, maybe it wasn't supposed to be relaxing. Maybe the aulos was there to encourage everybody to eat and get out. That is, of course, one reason restaurants play music today. The right music tends to make people buy more stuff and gulp it down faster and then either buy even more stuff or leave and open up the table for other customers. Here's a uh, a somewhat famous quote from the guy whose job it was at the time to pick all of the music for the Chipotle burrito chain. This is a gentleman, Chris Galoob talking to Bloomberg in 2013. He said, the lunch and dinner rush have songs with higher beats per minute because they need to keep the customers moving. That's what the man said, and he has science to back him up. Based on the number of published papers, you would think that the effect of music on consumer behavior is one of the most pressing questions in our society, but... Here are the two biggest factors that determine whether a question is researched. One, is there money out there for it? And two, can it be easily researched? Yes and yes. The hospitality industry accounts for about 10% of global GDP, according to several estimates that I've seen. So there are lots of people who want to fund a study on how music affects eating and drinking behavior. And it is also so very easy to study. A restaurant is a closed, controlled environment. Many aspects of what goes on in there are already quantified. What do people order? How much do they spend? When and where do they spend it? Every restaurant is gathering that data every day. All they have to do is change the music and see how sales change. And of all the things to change in a restaurant, the music has got to be literally the easiest thing to change. I mean, the music and the light, right? You just hit a few buttons and you've radically changed the ambiance of the room. Compare researching that to researching the effect of decor or paint color or table height or something. There you actually have to do something and have materials to alter the variable that you're investigating. But a restaurant can just hit the raise volume button twice and see if they sell more food this week than they did last week, which is something they're obviously tracking anyway. So a scholarly researcher might not be able to do such a field experiment because then you're studying human subjects without their informed consent, and we have lots of ethical rules and a few laws about that. But certainly businesses are doing their own proprietary research. like They do that kind of thing all the time, right? And a scholar might be able to do that kind of thing depending on the specifics. You would obviously want to consult your local institutional review board before proceeding with your, your, your own research, but... Uh, it's also relatively easy for a researcher to create a restaurant-like environment in a lab and to recruit test diners with a, you know, full informed consent and get them in there and serve them food and play them music and then check their plates afterward to see what they ate. Hey, can I pay you $20 to eat a meal for science? That's a much easier ask than, hey, can I pay you 20 bucks to hook you up to wires through which I can administer a painful electric shock in order to study the effect of negative reinforcement on ESP ability. And yes, that's from Ghostbusters, not from real life, but you know, art imitates life. Lots of experiments involve doing some real weird things to people. 
dinner on me is a pretty modest ask by comparison. And lots of papers have been done and lots of papers have found all kinds of really striking correlations between music and diner behavior. Some music seems to make people happier, but they consume less. Maybe they won't spend so big, but uh, they're more likely to come back again. Some music seems to make people willing to splurge on more expensive items. Classical music does that, obviously, because it makes you feel fancy. Fast music, high-tempo music, tends to make people eat more, etc., etc. We're going to get into a bunch of specific studies, but first, I think we ought to consider how instruments ended up in the dining room in the first place. And on that question, I can find no real scholarship, probably because there is no obvious constituency interested in paying for such research, nor is there an easy way to conduct such research. We can't go into the ancient Greek pot and ask them, hey, why'd you have the naked aulos player for the feast. And even if we could ask them that, they might just respond with, well, dead ass or something similarly unilluminating. Or is that answer totally illuminating? Music, eating, and sex form a sort of triangle, don't they? Any point on that triangle tends to lead to the other and then to the other other. All three activities are things we do for pleasure as well as to satisfy practical needs, like nourishment and reproduction. Music is the least practically necessary point on that triangle, and yet it does still have some practical utility in, say, helping everybody to coordinate physical actions. You know, soldiers marching to the beat of a drummer is the obvious example that comes to mind, or, or like rowers rowing a boat to the drums, but there are so many other examples from pre-industrial life, like all of the rice-pounding songs from East Asia. You know, modern wheat kernels just fall out of their husk with a little bit of shaking, but rice tends to be a little harder to get out of its husk, depending on the variety. So the traditional way you do this is with a giant mortar and pestle, You dump your rice into a big stone basin, and then you just kind of stab at it with a big, heavy, blunt instrument to knock off the husks. It takes forever, but you can do it a lot faster with friends. You get a few friends, you all stand around the same stone basin full of rice, you each grab your own big, heavy stick with which you're going to pound the rice. You reach your heavy stick high into the sky to get some momentum, You deliver a crushing blow to the rice, and then as you're raising your heavy stick back into the air to take another swing, your friend pounds the rice with her heavy stick, and you interlace your respective strokes so that the rice is getting pounded at a tempo far faster than any single human could achieve. It's a great system, but it requires close coordination. If you and your friend both try to pound the rice on the same beat, you're going to end up hitting each other with your big heavy clubs. So you sing a song to keep everybody in time with each other. I know I'm supposed to strike the rice on the first beat of the bar. My friend knows she's supposed to strike on the second beat, etc. And there you have this whole history of communal rice pounding songs. The striking of the rice itself and the percussive sound it makes became part of the music. And this is part of the origin legend of traditional Indonesian, mostly percussion ensemble music known as gamelan. Like many insufferable white dudes, I played in a gamelan in college. And the hardest thing for a Western musician such as myself to adjust to is how interconnected gamelan compositions tend to be. I mean, everybody in a Western orchestra is locked in with everybody else, and they're all layering parts on top of one another in rhythm with the conductor, but the interlocking is so much more extreme in gamelan. In an orchestra, you might play like a little melody on your instrument, and that melody coexists with some chords that other musicians are playing, or maybe a counter melody or a little rhythmic accompaniment. With gamelan, it's more like the whole orchestra is playing the whole melody together 
only I'm playing the first note, you're playing the second note, that guy over there will play the third note, and it's going to go so fast. It's going to go digga, 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 and each of us has to be there with our individual dig or uh at the exact right time, and that's really hard. The only comparable thing in Western music is uh, change ringing uh, or uh, bell choirs, it's also called. It's like where one person holds one or two bells of different pitches. And if everybody in a line of bells rings their one little bell at the right time, then you get Carol of the Bells. Ding, 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 ding. Hey, that's a Ukrainian tune, by the way, Carol of the Bells. Uh, and it's only about like a hundred years old. I just learned that the other day. Anyway, we have, uh, we got, we have bell choir music here in the West, but it's generally far simpler than Indonesian gamelan in terms of how everybody's individual parts interlock. Gamelan textures are ridiculously dense. I remember one time I was playing the, uh, the bass instrument in a gamelan ensemble consisting of, uh, bamboo xylophone type instruments. And there were two of these bamboo basses and me and the other bass player were supposed to play the same bass lines, but a 16th note apart is how I would think of it in my Western music terminology. So the bass part would be something like digga, 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 only she would be playing the digs and I would be playing the us, right? In Western music, that's called a hocket, and it's ridiculously hard to execute at fast tempos. The only way I could do it was to ghost the digs or the downbeats by silently hitting my leg with my left hand. So I'd be playing, uh, 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 and that's how I could do it. The Balinese guy who was leading the ensemble saw me doing that with my leg, and he didn't like it, but he tolerated it. What he could not tolerate was the time when my fellow bass player was sick. She missed rehearsal. So I shoved our two bamboo xylophone thingies together so that I could play them both at the same time. My left hand playing the downbeats on her instrument and my right hand playing the upbeats on my instrument. It was so much easier and I was so proud of myself. And the Balinese conductor guy was just like, no, 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 we don't do that. You play the part with someone or you don't play it at all. And only much later did I understand why. For one thing, Gamelon derives a lot of its characteristically shimmering quality from the slight inaccuracies that occur as humans try to interlock with each other over such a tight space of time. Being slightly off time, as you inevitably will be, is essential to the feel of the music, and that is not at all unique to Gamelon, but it is particular to Gamelon, and the bass part definitely sounded more robotic when I played both parts myself. And the other thing I failed to understand is that gamelan isn't just music for the sake of music. It's music as social exercise. It evolved from people pounding rice together, if the legend is to be believed, and I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but let's go with the legend for the sake of conversation. The music evolved from people pounding rice together, and it's supposed to serve the same function of bringing people together and prompting them to work together as a tightly integrated unit, to exercise that collective muscle for the time when we'll really need to work closely together, whether in war or in wet field rice cultivation, which requires incredible coordination among lots of people to pull off. And people have long speculated that that may explain the particular collectivist mindset of rice eating cultures, though that speculation is not without controversy. The point is, gamelan is a social exercise, particularly so given the hocketing nature of the parts. But all ensemble music is a social act, as is food preparation and consumption, as his sex, the two other points of the triangle. They're all social acts. I mean, music, sex, and food can all be performed solo as well, but there's so much more we can achieve in a group setting, don't you think? Small groups for me, but you know, you do you. 
Food production and consumption we tend to do in groups for practical reasons. Music we tend to play together for practical reasons. But even when we play music solo, it still tends to be a social act because sound is difficult to contain. It spills out everywhere. Everybody hears it. It draws a crowd in the same way that delicious cooking smells draw a crowd via airborne contagion. And there are similar anthropological theories of sex. Skip ahead a couple of minutes if you don't want to hear details. I mean, speaking of activities that require multiple people to perform a repetitive action in close coordination with each other. Our modern sensibility in which coupling is a synonym for getting down The fact that we consider sex and coupling to be synonymous expresses our modern bias in favor of monogamous two-partner relationships. There are anthropologists and primatologists who study sex who think that, historically speaking, it would more often have been a group affair, where perhaps two people get down to it, and the, the reason that they instinctively make so much noise is to attract competing males who might like to try their hand, as it were. Sex has its own airborne contagion. I could make some really profane communal rice-pounding jokes right now, but I won't. One hypothesis as to why women generally require more and longer stimulation to achieve satisfaction is that perhaps such women are motivated to have a second go with the second gentleman who has arrived on scene, and he may be more fertile than the previous guy, his swimmers stronger, and his genetic material stronger, and thus the children of such a woman would be stronger and more numerous, etc., and... Even if it's only between two people, sex remains a social act, like music and eating. And these are three social acts that we like to do. It makes sense to combine pleasures. Yeah, this food is amazing, but what would make this situation even better? How about some music? Music with your meal is also a great way of establishing class dominance, because prior to the advent of sound recording which was like last week in the scheme of human history, prior to the advent of sound recording, it would have been difficult to make music while eating. It would have been hard to play an instrument while eating, and it would be impossible to sing while eating. So this is when the lord of the manor would clap his hands to summon his minstrels, or when the emperor would summon his geisha, and she would pluck the koto delicately while everyone of higher status gorged themselves. And this is when some dude starts drafting an angry email. Hey, geishas were super high status in their own way too, Adam. The great thing about music at a meal is that it fills the gaps. Silence is awkward in a social situation. And when people get their food and start eating, their vocal apparatuses are occupied with the work of chewing and swallowing, all of which prevents them from talking and keeping the conversation going. It also makes a lot of gross sounds. And music fills the gaps in the conversation while subtly drowning out all of the yucky lip smacking. Perhaps this is one reason people also like music during sex. Anyway, I reckon this is how music ended up in the dining room. Music is a pleasure that is highly complementary with eating. The two don't get in each other's way, as long as you're high status enough to have someone else play for you while you eat. Or if you're not, you might get done eating pick up the lyre that's there in the middle of the table like a centerpiece, and then you play. And because everybody is already gathered together and none of them want to do anything, they just want to sit around and digest, you get after-dinner chamber music. I think that's how music ended up in the dining room. And it all got a lot simpler and cheaper and, frankly, less special with the advent of recorded music. It's just another thing we don't value enough anymore because we tend to have too much of it. You know what else is on that list? Salt. 
Sodium is this utterly crucial mineral nutrient that also happens to taste delicious, and it was so hard for inland peoples to find until industrial production made salt literally cheaper than water, bottled water at least. And now we look down on salt simply because some people get too much of it. But the sponsor of this episode knows all about how special salt really is. I am talking about Element, which you can find at Drink Element, which is Drink drinklmnt.com slash Adam. LMNT is pronounced element. Kind sponsor of the uh, Ragusia pod and creator of deliciously salty electrolyte drinks for people who could actually use some more sodium and magnesium and such in their diet. I'm talking about, hold on, let me have a sip. Mm. Of course, I'm talking about athletes, uh, manual laborers, anyone else who sweats a lot. Sweating just hemorrhages sodium. And when you don't have enough sodium, you get dehydrated because your kidneys have to maintain a constant uh, salinity level in your blood. And so if you lose salt, you have to lose water to keep sodium and water in balance in your body. I'm also talking about dieters, like people who go from eating your standard Western trash diet to eating a really strict diet. They could easily end up becoming salt deficient and, uh, or defi- and other electrolytes too, because you, uh, you get those significantly from processed foods nowadays. And when you, when you start to eat a little bit better, yeah, you could end up eating not quite enough salt. And when you're deficient in salt, you get headaches, you get muscle cramps, weakness, brain fog, all kinds of bad things. So Element is an evidence based drink mix that's designed to replenish your electrolytes without loading you up on sugar and artificial colors and flavors and other things that you might not like. You may be sweating for the express purpose of burning calories, so why would you want to ingest even more in your electrolyte drink? The answer is I don't want to, right? Well, check out Element. It's just a very intentional mixture of sodium and chloride and magnesium and potassium, plus some simple flavorings to make it fun to drink, stuff like citric acid and uh, stevia leaf extract, but no colors, nothing else. It's delicious. You can get a free sample pack of different flavors with any purchase that you make at uh, drinklmnt.com slash Adam right? Try the flavors yourself or just uh, give it to a friend. They offer no questions asked refunds on all orders, and you can get the uh, free sample pack with any purchase, even if you're a returning customer. And it's only available through a link like mine, drinklmnt.com slash Adam. Thank you, Element. Anyway, music in the dining room became much simpler and cheaper with the invention of sound recording, which first happened in the 1850s, But recorded music didn't start sounding really good until the production and reproduction got really good in like the second half of the 20th century. And once recorded sound reproduction got really, really good, people stopped hiring bands for restaurants and most bars. And now young musicians have to cut their teeth playing on Instagram or whatever, or more likely they just never really cut their teeth at all because there's no place for them to play for other people who actually want to hear them. It's pretty sad. But capitalism loves recorded music because it's cheap and music induces people to consume more stuff at least certain kinds of music. Music in general seems to be a net zero for retail establishments. It can either help or hurt sales. That is the conclusion of a 2017 literature review on this topic performed by scientists from Germany, Austria, and South Korea. Uh, This paper is called Thank You for the Music or Not? The Effects of In-Store Music in Service Settings. These authors compiled and analyzed findings from dozens and dozens of studies looking at the effect of music in restaurants and grocery stores and other retail settings. I will say again, this is probably the best research tip I can offer anyone. If you want to investigate what the science says about a topic, just go to Google Scholar, put in some search terms, and add the word review and then sort your findings in reverse chronological order. Look for the most recent scholarly literature reviews done on your topic. 
the whole job of conducting such a review is to garner the big picture from all of the tiny, narrow studies that scientists and other scholars have done previously. The researchers might not have done a perfect job in drawing that big picture, but they probably did a better job of it than you would, unless you are also a qualified scholar working in this field, which you probably aren't. Otherwise, why would you be taking my advice on searching for literature reviews? Anyway, these reviewers note that music can encourage or discourage consumption. It depends what kind of music you're playing and how loud you're playing it. Loud, high-tempo music is significantly positively associated with good mood among the patrons, to a point, and it is associated with greater purchase intentions. Loud music, and to a lesser extent fast music, tends to make people buy more drinks or food or widgets or whatever you're selling. Again, up to a point. You can play music so loud that people will just want to leave. Music that's loud enough obscures customer chatter and other distracting, potentially unpleasant sounds, and that seems to be good for business. Loud music creates little zones of privacy within the establishment, right? If people have to be right next to me to hear what I'm saying, that means conversation doesn't spill from table to table. The upper limit for loud music seems to be around 90 decibels, which is about the upper limit that uh, audiologists consider safe. Anything beyond that can potentially damage your hearing, which is why we're evolved to find it painful, which is why we don't like to eat in places where music is over 90 dB. For context, you know, somebody whispering to you, somebody whispering is generally about 25 decibels. Normal indoor conversation is usually about 60 decibels, which is why there was a short-lived podcast company called 60DB that uh, got bought by Google in 2017. Start up, cash out. Good work if you can get it. My old, uh, my old public radio buddy, Steve Henn, uh, made his bones with 60DB. Uh, good for him. Anyway. When you get up to around 90 dB or 100 dB, you're talking about the loudness of like power tools and such. And that's as far as you can push the music and still have it be potentially good for business, according to this literature review. Up until that painful point, the louder the music, the more people consume. Though that's speaking across all kinds of retail service businesses. Really loud music seems to be better for business in like stores than it is in restaurants and bars. In restaurants and bars, people still want to be able to hear each other talk. And so the ideal music volume seems to be lower, though up to a point, the louder the music, the more the food, the more drinks people tend to order. Also, the faster the music, the more people consume. In general, though there is lots of individual variation there, people have speculated that this might be the result of music changing the way that we perceive time. You know, time seems to go faster when listening to energetic music, perhaps. Maybe that makes us pull out our wallet a little more often. But the authors of this review reported no statistically significant impact of music on people's perception of time. This has been directly investigated with studies where they, they play people music and then they ask them to guess how much time has passed. Music seems to slow time for some people, speed it up for others. I imagine it depends on how much you like the particular music in question. Higher tempo music also tends to make people spend less time in your establishment. For example, one study of grocery shoppers found that people spend two fewer minutes in the store on average when they played fast music in the store. But that's only a bad thing from the standpoint of the store if people actually buy less. If they just move faster, buy stuff faster, and leave sooner, making room for more customers, well, that'd be good for business. And here the results are mixed if you look at the studies. Fast music is negatively associated with sales in some studies, particularly in restaurants and bars. People seem to leave 10 or 15 minutes sooner when you play fast music in an eating and drinking establishment, and that resulted in less consumption in a couple of the studies cited by these reviewers. Looking at the overall research in the overall retail market, speed sells more likely than not, but it's a mixed bag. And slower music might make people feel more relaxed in a mealtime setting and be more likely to hang around and order another round of drinks. 
But one thing that's clearly good for business is when the music is familiar to people. No surprise there. A tune they know. Unfamiliar music was more likely to be associated with less consumption. So that's why you hear the same old songs over the PA every time. Popularity is not a perfect proxy for familiarity, but there is a lot of overlap there, and the research indicates that top 40 radio hits show the strongest positive correlation with consumption, top 40 and classical. Study after study shows that people opt for the more expensive option if classical music is playing. It makes me think of the iconic old television commercial where uh, one Rolls Royce pulls up to another and the passengers roll down their windows to talk to each other. And they do this using electronic window controls, which were new and very cool at the time, because there's there's no nonchalant way to lower a car window with the old school hand crank. These two uh, limo passengers nonchalantly lower their windows and uh, elegant classical music plays while one rich guy asks the other, pardon me, do you have any gray poupon? And the other rich guy says, oh, but of course, because all fancy people get driven around in Rolls Royces whilst they eat Dijon mustard and listen to Mozart. That's what it's like. Top 40 music has the best track record at getting people to consume more, but classical music has the best record of getting them to consume the more expensive options. Jazz is a mixed bag. It's been shown in some studies to depress consumption, but in some contexts it seems to help business, as in restaurants where people find jazz to be reasonably relaxing and classy in the way that classical music is, perhaps prompting them to uh, you know buy the bigger ticket items. In most studies, easy listening music depresses consumption the most. Soft rock, yacht rock, smooth jazz, that kind of thing. People generally consume less in the presence of easy listening, perhaps because they just want to get away from it, though the authors note that there is huge individual variation there. It all depends what kind of restaurant or store you're running, and and you have to keep in mind the cultural bias that's inherent in basically all science? You know, most science is done in places where people are rich enough to be able to concern themselves with scientific endeavors. And so studies tend to come from rich countries. Rich countries are full of rich people, and it is their perspective that is more likely to be represented in science. Nearly every study these reviewers cite is from one of the same old Western countries you'd expect, mostly the United States. And that isn't necessarily a failing on the part of the reviewers. That's probably just where the studies exist. And Genre preference is something that's going to depend a lot on cultural context. For example, there's a classic study from the late 1990s out of the UK where they set up a display of French and German wines in a British supermarket. And sometimes they played really stereotypical Frenchy accordion music near this display. And sometimes they played really stereotypically German oompa band music. And people were far more likely to buy the German wine when the oompa music was playing. And they were far more likely to buy the French wine with the accordion music playing. And what's more, most of them were totally unaware of how the music was influencing them, according to follow-up questionnaires that the researchers administered. Most people denied that the silly German music made them pick the German wine, though the data suggest it did. (laughs) And music seems to hit men and women differently. The research indicates that women buy more stuff when music is a little softer, and also when the music is uh, more instrumental in character rather than vocal. Interesting. Of course, there's more to life than money, (laughs) and therefore, the ability of an establishment to drive sales is not the only lens through which we should examine the effect of music on eating and drinking. We should also consider health and happiness, right? But while I've still got you thinking about business, perhaps your business, 
Let me tell you about the best way to find and recruit top talent for your business, and that is with Indeed, sponsor of this episode. If you need to hire someone, just go to Indeed.com slash Ragusea. It is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire people all in one place. You don't need to spend hours posting your job in dozens of different job sites. Indeed is all you need. You upload your job description, you sponsor your job with Indeed, and then you've got an 80% chance of instantly finding a candidate whose resume on Indeed matches your job description. 80% of employers find qualified people instantly, according to Indeed's U.S. data. Then you got to get that candidate vetted and hired, right? Indeed can help you there too. There is Indeed assessments, the tests that the candidates can take online to prove their skills to you. You can also reach out and personally invite qualified people to apply for your job and do a virtual interview with them. Indeed's data shows that candidates whom you invite to apply through Indeed Instant Match, they are three times more likely to actually apply for your job compared to people who just find your posting through search. Indeed knows that you're growing your own business, and so you've got to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Requirements. Join over 3 million businesses worldwide using Indeed to hire great talent fast. Indeed.com slash Ragusea. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Indeed.com slash Ragusea. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Anyways, how music affects eating beyond the uh, simple dollars and cents of the matter. Well, here's a 2020 literature review out of Oxford. Atmospheric Effects on Eating and Drinking, a review by Charles Spence, who is a psychologist who does tons of interesting research on gastronomy, and we should interview him sometime, but... Spence notes that French versus German wine study and a similar one where a cafeteria offered Italian food or Spanish food and people were far more likely to buy the Spanish food if flamenco music was playing, etc. And Spence raises the concern that the global popularity of American pop music might induce more people around the world to choose American-style fast food, which is probably not the healthiest option available to them. There's a 2019 study out of China where they explored a previously documented phenomenon having to do with pitch. Uh, Music that is predominantly lower in pitch seems to prompt people to do what they want to do, whilst music that is predominantly higher in pitch seems to prompt people to do what they feel they should do. (laughs) High music induces morality. Bass makes people crazy. I think we kind of know that from our anecdotal experience, right? And in this study in China, they found that people were more likely to make the right choice, the healthier choice in a restaurant setting with high-pitched music playing. You hear the angels singing on either shoulder, and you are more likely to disregard that devil telling you to get the cake. Devils love chocolate cake, I hear. There's a 2012 study out of Cornell and Georgia Tech where they didn't just look at the restaurant receipts, they looked at what people actually ate or what they left on the plate. And they found that softer, slower music tended to result in fewer calories consumed and yet higher reported feelings of satisfaction. That's pretty interesting. So if you're not just trying to sell food, if your goal is to enjoy food and not eat too much of it, Definitely go with the slower, softer music. But any music, as compared to no music, does seem to result in more calories consumed, not less. And there's a 2008 study from Eastern Michigan University where they tried playing music for nursing home residents with dementia, people who often don't eat as much as they should. And the subjects ate 20% more calories in the presence of familiar music compared to no music at all. And some of these effects might be attributable to how the sound makes the food taste. 
Dr. Spence from Oxford summarizes some of the research thusly. He points out that uh, a couple of studies find loud noise actually suppresses our ability to taste sweet and salt while enhancing the perception of umami. And those studies used actual noise to test this, white noise in one study and jet engines in another study. Spence does speculate that we might observe similar results if we repeated those experiments with loud music, especially music played in a large reverberant room with lots of flat, smooth surfaces that reflect sound in a million different directions and convert even the most ordered sound into a noisy jumble. It's funny, when I was a kid, wall-to-wall carpeting was much more popular than it is now, and it was even popular in fancy restaurants, I think because carpet softens all the sounds. Carpet is tremendously inconvenient for eating and drinking establishments because when people spill on carpet, it is much harder to clean. Another thing I remember from my childhood is going to fancy restaurants with tons of carpet, and there always seemed to be a lot of those non-motorized manual carpet sweepers around, you know, the ones that look like little vacuum cleaners, but they don't have any wires or anything. Every restaurant host used to have a little manual carpet cleaner on a stick nearby. You don't see those much anymore, in part because you don't see carpet in restaurants much anymore. To my chagrin, being a person who has a lot of of trouble uh, hearing clearly in noisy reverberant restaurants and bars. There's also a funny study out of Nashville, Tennessee, 2017, Sound Spicy, Enhancing the Evaluation of Piquancy by Means of a Customized Cross-Modally Congruent Soundtrack. They found that people reported a higher spice or heat level in their food when they were listening to spicy music as they ate. And the researchers defined spicy music by conducting an online survey where people were asked to to sort different musical selections into different categories. And they simply played the music that people online categorized as spicy. I'm guessing it was a like Latin heavy playlist. And when they served this spicy salad to patrons at a restaurant in Nashville, people rated the salad as being hotter when they ate it while listening to the hot music. In considering this research, I am struck by yet another similarity between music and food. They both have become so ubiquitous over the last century or so that you almost don't notice them anymore. Music and food are everywhere. And anecdotally, personally, I think that has made both music and food far less special and therefore less enjoyable pound for pound. We are all just so spoiled. Imagine being a pre-modern peasant in Europe. The only music you ever hear is the terrible choir in your little parish church. And then whatever folk music they play down at the pub, probably on lute-like instruments. Neither music is likely to be very good because music is hard and most people who play music aren't very good. We live in a world today where you rarely hear music that's actually bad. You hear music all the time that is uninspired, uncreative, or just distasteful to you. Same thing with food. We get food all the time that is boring and standardized and just kind of limp, but very rarely do we get food that's actually bad, like a piece of meat that's almost exclusively fat and gristle or bread with lots of sand or sawdust in the flour. You don't get that very often anymore, nor do you hear someone playing an instrument who literally can't mash out the right notes. Even when people can't play or sing to save their lives, well, their performances still get cleaned up in a computer before you ever hear them. The only way you ever hear truly bad music is if you or someone you live with is, you know, learning. But in this pre-modern European village, there's only one guy who even has a lute, and he just never really learned to play that sucker, though that doesn't stop him from trying when he gets a few pints in his belly. And as a pre-modern peasant, that's all you know of music. 
until you take a pilgrimage to St. Thomas Church in Leipzig. You step into the nave and you hear Johann Sebastian Bach himself playing a pipe organ that is bigger than any made object you've ever seen before that isn't a building. The impact of that sound on such a person must have been astounding. There's a reason the church tried to corner the market on music. Back in the day, it really put butts in the pews, and it awed people into believing. Now I just find the sound of the organ to be annoying and cheap, because I'm used to keyboard sounds being among the easiest to reproduce electronically, and thus the sound of the organ lost almost all of its value. It's aesthetic inflation. When all the good stuff is all around all the time, it takes more and more of it to satisfy you. We're all just chasing the dragon all the time, trying to have an experience of listening to music where it, it hits us as hard as it did when we first heard it as kids, or, or we're trying to have an experience of eating food that matches the intensity with which we once experienced food when we were actually hungry, like haven't eaten for days levels of hungry. Nothing tastes remotely as good as any food when food is actually scarce. I used to work as a small town reporter, and I remember I was on an assignment one time to cover a university athletic event where they had like a spread of food out for anybody who wanted it. I was young and poor and had no money for food, and I was so hungry. But reporters are generally not supposed to take the food in such situations. You're not supposed to take anything of value offered by the people you're writing about so as to not compromise your impartiality. You can accept a glass of water and that's it. I wrestled with this impasse for a while and then I said to myself, you know, if they want me to be perfectly ethical in all situations, they need to pay me more. I need food. I'm taking food. I'll stop taking the food when they raise my salary. And that was the greatest tasting ham sandwich I have ever had. It was both scarce and forbidden. Those are the two most alluring seasonings you can put on anything. It's a shame that both food and music have become so abundant as to not be special anymore. Music and food are both just fillers. You know, you got some people together and you're worried they're going to be bored or awkward. Put some food and drinks out and you'll give them something to do. Turn on some music and you'll plaster over all the awkward silences. It's even worse with music because while food is cheap, music is essentially free nowadays. There is, there is no way to effectively monetize recorded music on the internet Though, it's still somewhat possible to monetize a composition, the purely theoretical arrangement of notes and words that comprise a song. Restaurants and bars all around the world still pay annual fees to BMI and ASCAP and other so-called performance rights organizations that track how a composer's work is being performed or broadcast or otherwise publicly exhibited around the world, and they collect and pay out the fees to composers. That's why the songwriter in the band always makes way more money than everybody else in the band. If you have a bar or a restaurant in the United States and most other developed countries and you have bands come and they play covers, or even if you just play recorded music off an iPad or whatever, you have to pay performance licensing fees that ultimately go to the people who wrote that music. The fees can range from like a few hundred to a few thousand dollars a year, depending on what kind of place you, you're talking about. Nowadays, there are streaming services available specifically to businesses that do all the work of paying the license fees for you, but ultimately they're still passing the cost on to you. So me, as a washed up composer and songwriter myself, I'm quite happy that restaurants and bars blast loud music, even if I find it annoying as a customer because every time you hear the bell, an angel gets its wings. And aren't you just an angel for sticking with me through yet another Adam Ragusea pod? Hey, the uh, Adam Ragusea chef knife, still 10% off 
at adamragusia.com. Go check it out. 10% off. Send in contributions for a future episode to askadamquestions at gmail.com. I just had such a great time shooting a video about glassware where I got to film some like old school glass blowing. That will either be this week's video on YouTube or maybe next, maybe next week. Those glass melting furnaces are so unbelievably hot. Like nothing prepares you for how hot it feels to stand in front of one of those. It's, it is like standing before the sun itself. Make good choices, especially around hot things. Talk to you next time.